welcome to another video on the solid foundation. Today I would like to bring, bring you closer to where we are in the enforcing of the mark as we did in the last video. Now, take for example, Christ was baptized in AD 27 and crucified in AD 31. Now, the Roman Catholic Empire ruled the world from 168 BC to uh, 476 AD, and since that time, the world entered the Dark Ages. Now, the term Dark Ages, as many of you may know, referred to a period between the fall of the Roman Empire and the Renaissance period. That's like from the 5th to the 14th century. Now, we know a lot of things happened during that time. But spiritually, the papacy was formed and the church took a major role without the military might of Rome because Rome you know, no longer existed as such as a military power. The Pope was the final voice in what people understood of who God was. He played that major role and the level of corruption and, and despair, my goodness, was just great. Now, God has never forgotten his people and the sanctuary as it was in the olden days still is the way that we can use to get back to God. Now, let me show you from, from the 14th century, God started to restore his truth as taught in the sanctuary to the Israelites back then. And uh, we can use that still today. And he used that through the reformers and the reformation period. Now, each of these guys, were attacked as teaching heresy and some were killed. Almost all of them were excommunicated by the Catholic Church back then. Many, as they started, were branded as cults. And, and that's how the devil works. You know? And so here, here's a quick look at what was restored and how God used these men to restore the teaching of the sanctuary. Take, for example, John Wycliffe. He was born in, 13, in the 1320s. He was an English scholastic philosopher, a theologian, a biblical translator, a reformer, a priest, and even a seminary professor at the University of Oxford. Now, Wycliffe and his followers were later, later derogatorily referred to as the low lords. They had come to regard the fact that scriptures should be the only reliable guide to the truth about God, the Bible, the truth. And they maintain that all Christians should rely on Bible rather than on the teaching of popes or clerics. And that's so powerful. You know, he said that there was no scriptural justification for the papacy. He even rejected the concept of purgatory and praying to saints. They believe that instead of, uh, of what the Pope established, they believe in a lay priesthood in that, you know, in which all the faithful, they are on equal footing in the eyes of God. And that's what we believe. The way to God is through Jesus Christ. And that's what the sanctuary taught. So as you walk in, you have the altar of sacrifice there. The way to God is through Jesus Christ, not through a Pope or anyone else. So note that he started the low large in the 1300s. Now, Martin Luther, and he came on the scene in 1482, and he was a German professor of theology, a priest, an author, a seminal figure in the Reformation. Now, he came also to reject several of the teachings and the practice of the Roman Catholic Church. In particular, he disputed the view of this indulgence. And Luther taught that salvation and consequently eternal life, they are not earned by your good deeds, but they are received only as a free gift of God's grace through your faith, believing in faith uh, 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 in Jesus Christ as your Redeemer from sin. And that's very important. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, stayed from the foundation of the world. Now, his, theolo his theology challenged the authority and the office of the Pope by teaching that the Bible is the only source of divinely, you know, that, was, that you can divinely understand and receive divine knowledge. Now, we all know about the thesis and all the different things he nailed to the door, but there are some things that he talked about. He said the sola fide, which is Latin for faith alone. The most important for Luther that he said here, Luther was that the doctrine of justification, God's act of declaring a sinner righteous by faith alone through God's grace. Now, he began to teach that salvation or redemption is a gift of God's grace, as I mentioned earlier, 
And you can only attain that true faith, not true indulgence or anything like that, true faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Now, he believed, this was powerful, he believed that the Catholic Church misled people when they said that whoever purchased indulgences would be either free of their sins or would reduce the time uh, you as a sinner would spend in purgatory. You know, all these things were atrocious. Now, Luther did not believe that the act of charity or good works or in God salvation. Salvation, my friends, cannot be earned. Salvation comes only from having faith in Jesus Christ alone. Um, Luther, another of, of the thing that he, he brought up was sola scriptura. I love this one, which basically is not a Latin for a scripture alone. And he felt that, you know, that uh, scripture was the only authority concerning the business of faith for any Christian believer. Which is to today. So if you don't want to read the Bible for yourself, you're in trouble because you will be misled. Now, Luther denied the Pope's traditional authority to teach the Word of God through his own interpretations, contrary to Bible, Scripture. And the Pope was including teachings uh, to believers to pray directly to Mary and to saints. All these things are not biblical, and Luther, Luther challenged that. All right, Luther accused the Pope and the Catholic Church of distorting Bible truths and corrupting the Christian teachings. And he came to the belief that the Bible, my friends, the Bible interpreted by individual believers was the only true authority of your faith and the faith of any Christian. So that's what he fought for. And God was using him to bring back the, the altar of showbread, so to speak, the word of God, the importance of that. He believed that faithful Christians must consider the Bible scriptures as the authentic word of God guided by the Holy Spirit, they can then interpret its meaning for themselves. And um, another of his tenants, he, he talked about uh, sola gratia, Latin for grace alone, all right? It is a belief that Luther shared with the Catholic Church, uh, with the exception, the Catholic Church kind of endorsed that although salvation is made possible by grace, faith and works of men are means to obtain grace. And that's where they kind of separated there. Now, the Catholic Church was endorsing a mixture of both, uh, you know, reliance on the grace of God and confidence in, in your own merits, the merits of a believer's own works performed with love. And, and we know it's by grace that we save true faith, a very powerful thing in that. Now, we're talking about the founder of the Lutheran Church. That's uh, and that happened in between the 14 to the 1500s. Now, when we look at John Calvin, another of these reformers, he came on the scene in like 1509. He was a French theologian, a pastor, uh, and a reformer in Geneva during the Protestant Reformation time. Now, he was a principal figure in the development of, uh, of the system of Christian theology, later called, uh, some people may remember, Calvinism. So that's what he was able to do. Now, he had five points of Calvinism. Calvinism. He will refer to it as a tulip, all right? Uh, and I'll only talk about the first one, which uh, the T stands for total depravity, all right, in this tulip of his five principles. Now, this total depravity, this asserts that as a consequence of the fall of man into sin, every person is enslaved to sin. People are not by nature inclined to love God, but rather to serve their own interests to and, and, and to reject the rule of God. So that's something that he talked about in one of his principles. So he is the key founder of what we may know today as the Presbyterian Church. He wasn't the only one, but the one that they adopted most of their beliefs from. And that started in the 1500s. We then had uh, John Smith. A lot of these guys named were John. John Smith, uh, Amsterdam. He came next and he had for two generation practice adult baptism based on a personal confession of faith. So he believed that, you know, if you want to show your personal confession of faith, you have to be baptized. And his view was that the Church of England was the Church of the Antichrist. These are things that these guys were preaching centuries ago. And hence, its baptism must be false. In fact, 
he wrote that the character of the beast in 1609 and that the baptism of all established churches were false. And so the New Testament never mentioned infant baptism, only the baptism of believing adults. And so he brought back to the fore the laver, the bronze laver with, with the water for the washing and cleansing. So through John Smith, we had the restoration, restoration of baptism as a key pillar for the church and not sprinkling as implemented by this cat, the Catholic Church, right? So we see the restoration of the bronze. We see the restoration of the laver. We see the restoration of the burnt sacrifice. All these things that these men through the Reformation brought back. So no, John Smith, he was the founder of the Baptist Church in the 1600s. Look at how time is progressing and what happened there. We then had John Wesley. John Wesley founded what is known as the Methodist Church in the 1700s. Now keep in mind, the term Methodist was originally a derogatory term used to mock John Wesley. Right? It wasn't endearing to him, but they just took it and accepted it. The same way Christian was used to mock the Christians way back uh, in the time in the first century there. And so they, uh, John Wesley and his early society, because of their dedication to following a method of growing close to God, they were called Methodists and they were mocked. Now, Wesley's biblical exposition is characterized by um, a dominance of the practical over the, the theoretical, so, so to speak. His sermons did not dwell upon problems of interpretation or anything like that. He followed his, mo his mother's advice in uh, making the Bible a practical book for day-by-day -day living. So this basically, he restored like the golden candlestick, let your light so shine. You know, you have to live out your, your life and your action before men. So we know that's where he was taking it from. So it's like witnessing. So they said he, you know, the amount of miles he rode on his horse sharing with the gospels like 10 times around the world. So he brought out that the, rest, the restoration, the candlestick, the teaching, the sharing of the word of God is a vital part of your Christian life. The golden commission, go ye therefore and teach all nations. So the early Methodists were concerned with Bible devotional and moral values and spend times on you know, contemplations. Wesley believed that uh, obedience to the known will of God must proceed and, and accompany any mastery of the Bible. You just, you just have to, to live it out and accept it and so on. Now, in 1844, another movement came out of the Great Disappointment and William Miller with the Millerite movement. People were looking for the coming of Christ there. Now, this group called themselves uh, the Seventh Adventists, and this group believe in many of the teachings of the Protestant church and the reformers coming out from darkness. But they stress the importance of the commandments of God. They stress the importance of the, especially the Sabbath and the value, they, 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 they value the gift of prophecy. Now, this group call themselves God's last day church because they believe that uh, they have been reared up by God to notify the world of His plan, especially uh, that message found in Revelation 14, and you can read from 6 through 12. And this they call the three angels' messages. Now, verse 6, for example, that thing says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This is what it says in Revelation 4, verse 6, verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the seas and the fountains of water. God is calling us back to worship him, know him, fear him, and worship him, not man or any other religious institution like that. No false system. And verse 8 says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is falling, is falling that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. In other words, you accepted her lies, all right? And you're just going blindly with it. Verse 9 says, And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast, and his image and receive his mark in his forehead, all right, and in his hand. Remember we said, by choice, if, if you worship the beast, if you made that decision to follow the beast in all of his lives and so on, that's what that verse is saying. You shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation 
and he shall be tormented with fire and with brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, which we believe is Jesus Christ here. Now, because you remember it says, Behold, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God will take away the sins of the world as he was talking to Jesus Christ here. Verse 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receive the mark of his name. Now, here is where verse 12 goes on to say, As we heard before, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And so that's why this church believed that, look, we are called to bring people back. God has been restoring the articles. He has been reminding his people all through the time that this is who I am. Learn of me through these facts. And they believe that they have been called to do that. And so since 1844, God has successfully restored the sanctuary system through the teaching of the reformers and in these modern times in which we live through the Seventh-day Adventist church. And like all other Protestant religions before, anytime you try to bring back what God wants, you will be labeled and called a cult. And this group was also called a cult when they started in 1844 and they moved through the time. So my friends, we are in the red zone in terms of football analogy, red zone territory there. When the world through the attack of the enemy will start to blame the church for its problems. Uh, they will blame the church for issues like with climate change. They will blame the, world, the church for things like poverty and moral degradation. And the Pope will once again strive to regain control over the masses. He will make another attempt to return the world to the control of the papacy, which misled the people and set itself up as God on earth. You saw this happening through the time. All right. Calls will be made for us to return to the mother church, so to speak. And everyone who resists this call will be seen as uh, heretics and teaching heresy. And eventually persecution will start again. Now, it is then and only then will the mark of the beast be, be, re, uh, and, and for, will be enforced. Why? Because it is then that all of us, you, me, everyone who's listening to this, will have to choose whether you will accept and obey the teachings of man over that of God, accept we are smart enough to process it, and whether we will obey, right? Whether we will obey, uh, laws will be instituted, religious laws will be instituted that will be false, and this will result in a Mount Carmel-like showdown with the false prophet of Baal and Elijah. Remember, he, uh, Elijah said, how long will you go back and forth? Now, we have been smart, we've been reading all of them for years. How long we go back and forth? So, are you ready, my friends, to take a stand for God? In the next video, I will look at what to expect just before this great conflict begins. And I would love to hear from your comments. If you like what you hear, drop me a comment at the bottom there. You can subscribe, you can like, share this video if you find it informative. But until then, next time, remember, a solid foundation is what you need. Let's learn about God's word. Let's hold on to his Bible learn for ourselves. Until then, take care. Until next time.